amusement park for all of the family, top of the line shopping centers, bright, bold and entertaining nightclubs and luxury accommodation overlooking all of Night City. All of this could be yours in one of the best tourist destinations in all of North America, or at least it would have been if it hadn't lost all of its investors within 2069. For now, the region of Pacifica lay as a place that could have been the Corpo's dream holiday destination, but is now full of crime and destruction, with homeless moving into it on a daily basis. Within the eastern part of this region, however, a giant wall separates the people of Night City from it, and within those heavily guarded walls is a unique society that is completely lawless, run by a once colonel of the NUSA, Kurt Hansen, who together with his faction known as the Bargast, want to make it one of the most prosperous areas in all of SoCal. But within this area lay many remnants of the past and some deadly secrets left by a mega corporation that if discovered could bring about utter chaos all over the world. So what is the story behind Pacifica and Dogtown? What were the initial plans for it? What is based inside the heavily guarded walls and what could be the future for this area of Night City? Well in today's episode we will be exploring all there is to Dogtown and the secrets it houses. And before we begin a word of warning, this video will contain major Phantom Liberty spoilers, so if you don't want to be spoiled by anything, you'll have to just play it first, then come back to me. But for now, this is the story behind the combat zone in the heart of Pacifica. This is the story behind the beautiful but deadly Dogtown. When Richard Knight first came up with the concept of his city that was originally named Coronado City within the 1990s, he had one idea on what it was going to be. This place was to be a utopia for those who embraced the capitalist ideas. Corporations would be free to trade as much as they want, they would be encouraged to invest millions into the infrastructure, and everything was to work hand in hand to make the most revolutionary and beautiful city anyone had ever seen. Thanks to this ideology, many corporations teamed up with him to make it happen which included Arasaka, EBM and Petrochem, setting up what is known as the Coronado Partnership. After a long period of turmoil during the construction of the city with many different changes in ownership due to the assassination of Richard Knight, eventually the corporations took over full rule of the city and were able to invest as much as they wanted into everything, setting up the iconic corporate plaza that was to be a shining light in the heart of the city, welcoming anyone that wanted to do business regardless of where they came from. As the corporations built up more and more, Night City also started developing vast urban areas that were filled with massively impoverished individuals who had lost their jobs due to the rising corporate employees and infrastructure. This led to a ton of urban violence and street crime by the year of 2020, with the corporate sector not really caring about what was going on there. In their eyes, it was none of their business, and to be honest, the poor killing each other just meant the population was always in check, and they didn't have to worry too much about providing more cheap housing. Houses. For a time, this was how Night City worked. The corporations ran the city, providing their workers with their own accommodation and pumped millions into building up their golden towers. During these early years of the 2020s, Militech saw an opportunity to build something to help them in their overall war effort and also to stop developing some technology that was to rival the rumored soul killer program that Arasaka housed that was to be their super weapon. This would all take place below the area that was to be the Pacifica region, where deep underground, Militech would start developing an underground city secretly named Project Sinoshore. The idea behind it, based on the very limited data that is out there, was that it was a research facility to help Militech netrunners dive into the deepest regions of cyberspace beyond the black wall that was set up after the data crash way back when, and capture the so-called rogue AIs to be most likely used as weapons in their future wars against other corporations who might threaten them, like Arasaka, for instance, making it clear that if Arasaka were to use their soul killer on a grand scale, Militech would have something to counter it. This facility was huge, housing hundreds of workers, all who were developing this impressive core, forging AI prototypes to use in battle, and spying on operations all over the globe. And all of that 
right under the noses of the people of not only Pacifica, but Night City itself. However, despite all looking like it was going well to some extent, this project would be pushed to its limits as the Fourth Corporate War kicked off between both them and Arasaka. As the war reached its peak in 2023, Militech would launch their infamous attack on the Arasaka headquarters in Night City, setting off multiple small nukes, obliterating the whole building with everyone within it, and also the whole of Night City around them, turning the whole of the corporate plaza into just a barren wasteland with radiation and red clouds filling the air. The people of Night City would go on to call it the Time of the Red, and suddenly, the corporations who had pumped millions into this utopia of a city had the task of fully rebuilding it all over again, but this time without the help of Arasaka, who provided a lot of money before the war took place. A few years after this attack, corporations started the rebuilding process, hiring a ton of nomads to go into the city, clear up any hazardous waste, and start building back up the city piece by piece, with the first focus being to get the corporate plaza back to its glorious state. Luckily, with the end of the Fourth Corporate War, the new United States of America decided it was in the interest of the country and the world to bring Militech into their ranks, nationalizing them to make sure no war like this could ever happen again. Now, under NUSA rule, Militech was free to start investing in the country as a whole to help the people of their country. A few years into the time of the Red when Night City was being fully rebuilt, investors turned their focus to the coastal area of the city and came up with a new plan to get corporations and rich clients spending their countless eddies in their city, and thus helping them grow even more, with many wanting this area to become the prime tourist destination in the whole of North America, if not the whole world. This place was to be a true paradise which would cater specifically to corporate employees and tourists alike. And with that goal, they would also hire Militech security contractors to help protect its golden sandy beaches, luxury hotels, and unmatched entertainment. Ultimately, this area would be known as the Pacifica District, with the eastern parts of it being known as the Serene Islands. Militech still stayed within the area and saw this as a prime opportunity to stay within Night City, to watch over all of its government, and to keep an eye on all of the other corporations doing business within it. This was quite ironic considering Militech were the ones who plunged this city into devastation in the first place. However, thanks to the president of the NUSA spinning the news story blaming Arasaka, many believed Militech were the saviors of the day. Although many spoke out about Militech's involvement, and many within Night City knew the truth of the matter, and what Militech did on that cold rainy day in 2023. As time went on after the Holocaust event, Militech started losing control within their secret facilities. The AIs, it was reported, had started taking over, destroying some of the Netrunners and their equipment, and sabotaging all of the data collected. Not only this, but Netwatch had gotten word about Netrunners breaking into the old net and going way past the black wall, and started to take action. It is unknown what was the specific reason for why Sinoshore closed. It could have been due to how deadly the rogue AIs they had captured were, or due to the heavy Netwatch presence. But regardless, the underground facility was shut down and abandoned, with all of the Militech equipment still remaining there, as well as the rogue AIs still there somewhere within their technology. This was to all get worse a few years later as the investors, who were looking to build up the Pacifica area as a tourist destination, rolled in and the construction began. Whilst working, the contractors would uncover the abandoned labs and suddenly were forced out of the area, with investors claiming it was due to a sudden dangerous gas leak, as well as bad documentation on local developments and unexploded ordnance from the Fourth Corporate War. Thanks to this, Militech moved in instantly to secure the area, to make sure no one saw the underground facilities and erected a wall around the area and stopped construction for a time anyway. Despite all of that, investors continued to build up Pacifica with that ultimate ambition of turning it into a tourist's paradise. By 2045, the Pacifica area was up and running as money was being pumped into luxury buildings and facilities on the coast and within the eastern area of the region. A playland by the sea amusement park was a flourishing landmark within the area that saw many people turning up to enjoy the rides. Seeing that the area was indeed going to be a big thing for tourists and rich clientele, corporations started putting up sponsorships all over the area, allowing for lots more redevelopment that helped attract more audiences from outside of the area, from such places like San Francisco and other parts of California. With this, it was clear that Pacifica was to be a grand success, and many new resorts were to be built all around with the Coast View condos being some of the first offering tourists a view 
view of the sea, as well as a luxurious, relaxing place to rest. Within the eastern part of the Pacifica district, some of the most standout places to visit would start being built to help bring in more tourists and also show off some of the standout achievements the corporations had been up to over the many years. One of these areas that would be under development during this time would be known as the Terra Cognita Technological Park within the Luxor Heights area. This technology park would be a scientist's dream, going to officially have its grand opening on the 10th of June 2069, housing showcases of some of the latest innovations. With the main building exhibitions housing the latest and greatest Nova Super Wheels powered by Chu 2, the Aviation Nation Sky's No Limit display for all planes, a Militech showroom with the title Engineering Liberty, a weapon showcase named the Combat Zone to show off the latest weapon technology, a Digiscape area displaying the net of the future, a Digimortal area showing all forms of cyberware technology, and even an Arasaka exhibition titled Mirai, the Japanese word for future, meaning it was most likely an exhibition promoting the corporation and where it's going into the future. But outside of the main exhibition were other more historical displays, such as an Anatomicon exhibition looking at the human body and its evolution over the years, a full display on the ESC Explorer and what it had done on its travels through the years, and the revolutionary exhibition on the organic planet named Organitopia, which looked at the world around us, biology, and dinosaurs from the world's past, such as the Mosasaurus and T-Rex, which has helped brought to life thanks to 3D lighting that covers the real skeleton of it, helping tourists to get a real sense of what this creature actually looked like, joining modern technology with ancient history. Also located within Luxor Heights would be some absolutely beautiful resorts for people to stay in, with its circular high peak hotel resort being its pride and joy. With the Eventide Resort and Spa, Luxor Heights Wellness Spa and Tranquil Terrace also known as the Luxor Heights Park finishing off the area, offering so much for all of the paying customers who want to spend their hard earned eddies within this fantastic district and city. Just further down from the Luxor Heights would be the main base of operations for this eastern part of the tourist haven of Pacifica, where during the late 2050s and 2060s, many big tourist attractions and sites would be created. The first being a building known as Jason Exiled that would be created within 2058 by the renowned monumentalist Emilda Ayala Caballo. This monument was said by many to be her greatest achievement, not because of how good it looked, but because it was perfectly incorporated within the grand mall known as the Eden Plaza, filled with all types of shops a corpo would love to shop in. Regardless of whether people considered it amazing or not, it certainly was a talking point and a perfect monument to have for tourists to come and see and discuss. The next big talking point was the grand skyscraper known as the Black Sapphire, which was put into place by the construction and development firm known as Halsey Ferris and Skiv, some of the original founders and creators of Night City as a whole. As development of this Black Sapphire started in 2061, it would have its overly ambitious aim of having a grand opening in 2065, where it would offer guests casinos, bars, luxury accommodation, iconic music and performance acts on a nightly basis, and to top it all off, a vast view all over the Pacifica region and the whole of the neon Night City skyline, giving the guests that perfect cherry on top to what would be an incredible holiday experience. Right next to this grand skyscraper would go on to be another monument which would first start construction in 2063 named The Needle. Designed by Gerard Cox with the aim of being a monument dedicated to the presidents of the United States of America. Similar in style to the Washington Monument and even being placed on the street known as George Washington Street. Once again, it would be another sightseeing thing for people to take photos of to document their experience within this luxury holiday resort. Down below, sitting next to the needle would be a multitude of places to visit for entertainment purposes, but also to go and spend their holiday eddies, such as the Coronado Bay Cinema, which would play the latest films on offer, the famous Mexican restaurant Capitan Caliente that was said to be extremely popular with guests all over, the Haven Clinic for all of those who were religious and needed a place to find peace and admit to their sins or seek spirituality, as well as be healed by their trained healers, a brain porium for all people's BD needs and desires, a founding our future innovation expo, and to top it all off in the center of the area, one of the most beautiful buildings amongst all of them, the Heavy Hearts Club. The Heavy Hearts Club was created around the same time as the Needle Monument, also being located on the George 
George Washington Street, and its whole aesthetic was to be based around Egyptian themes, being a striking neon pyramid that could be seen from miles out, and at night would project itself out through a singular light beam, inviting all guests into its incredible nightclub. It was an extremely closed off club, reserved only for the elite and high paying clients. It would be where the top business people would go to talk business, meet with clients and plan the future of their corporations. The name Heavy Hearts would be a reference to the ancient Egyptian belief that the souls of the dead had the hearts weighed before the feather of Mayat in the afterlife. Those whose hearts were heavier than the feather were seen to be impure and as such had their hearts devoured by the goddess Amit. Whether the creators of this pyramid club knew of its impact in the future of this area is unknown, but the symbology within the club including the two Siamese cats within the VIP areas looking very close to sphinxes all scream of this afterlife theme that makes the Heavy Hearts Club stand out so much, and also oddly similar in themes to the afterlife club within Night City itself. With all of these brand new buildings and monuments being set up, there was just one last thing that Night City wanted to add to top it all off as the perfect area. But this was always a project that Night City could never really get going or perfected and always struggled to get their foot in the door. This was a football stadium for their own Night City American football team. Back in the 2020s, Night City's original team known as the Rangers were taken out of the game thanks to the overwhelming turmoil happening within the city. Thanks to everything that was going on, Night City was one of the only metropolises within America without a dedicated American football team and for the government and corporations of this revolutionary city, this could not stand. They had to do something about it to help investments flowing into the city. With this goal in mind, when Pacifica started getting an influx in investors, a new super team would go on to be established named the Night City Nighthawks. This team was made thanks to the influx in oil money from EBM Petrochem, who had invested heavily in Night City from the off, allowing them to get the best players out there with the latest greatest cyberware to help them get the achievements they wanted. And they certainly did, making a massive impression on the National League with some of the most memorable plays people can remember to this day, even in captured within the central statue within the stadium itself, which EBM Petrochem also invested in. This stadium was to stand out massively, becoming one of the most modern venues to match with the new Pacifica identity. However, despite all of these plans going ahead and a new stadium being set up for the Nighthawks, the investment was just way too high for it to succeed and it all came crashing down dramatically and suddenly within just a few games of the season. And with that, the Nighthawks were no more. Night City did not want to give up however, they wanted to have a football team as they now had the perfect stadium to house them in, with Petrochem still heavily invested within it. This time, Night City owners took a new approach, and instead of building up a football team of their own, they would instead buy an existing one. Tempted by the promise of unprecedented tax exemptions, the owners of the Sacramento Corsairs agreed to relocate the team to Night City and thus turn them into the Night City Corsairs. To many football fans, however, Night City still to this date does not have a dedicated football team. They have only bought a successful one and that is not playing the true game. But for the Night City government and investors, does it really matter? They had put their name on the board, had a brand new modern EBM Petrochem football stadium and a team that was going to give them that success. Everything was looking perfect for the grand neon metropolis. Their Pacifica region was growing by the day with small shops doing regular business. The luxury hotels were close to being open to all paying customers. Entertainment facilities facilities were setting up all over, the amusement park was grand in scale and had something for everyone and even the Grand Imperial Mall located by the amusement park had its grand opening, offering all shopping customers a big 30% off everything in house for that day only, offering paying customers also a chance at winning free tickets to the Ferris wheel and roller coaster, selling it as being an opportunity to get the best view of the Night City skyline. This was the chance for Night City to become one of the best cities in all of America. However, the new president of the NUSA, Rosalind Myers, had other ideas. And now that Night City had come out of the time of the red and was close to ultimate success, it would go on to be plunged into yet another war and time of hardship. One that would completely destroy all of its ambitions of becoming the biggest tourist attraction in the whole of North America.
As Rosalind Myers took office, her sole ambition was to unite the whole of America who had broken off into different areas, with free states being distant from governmental rule. Realizing the only way to get the free states back into her fold would be through force, Rosalind Myers with the help of Militech would launch the Unification War, taking out almost all of the free states and bringing them back into her government's rule. The Republic of Texas and Night City were lucky enough to survive the NUSA attacks, however Militech had a fierce presence within the Pacifica region region thanks to their heavy investments years ago. Troopers flooded the area in their masses with high up troopers such as Colonel Kurt Hansen being there, ready to invade the whole city and plant that iconic Stars and Stripes flag and bring it under Myers' rule. As tension rose more and more between the NUSA, Militech and the Night City government, many of the investors who had pumped millions of eddies into Pacifica started pulling out instantly, expecting there to be a big war and a lot of destruction leaving the construction of the luxury hotels of the Luxor Heights and the Black Sapphire to be completely abandoned and essentially would never be completed with no money going into it by its once investors. But as combat started taking place within Pacifica, turning it into what was known as the Combat Zone, the once exiled Arasaka showed up to aid Night City and the rest of the Free States fighting against the NUSA, causing panic amongst the government ranks. It became clear to Myers that if she were to continue another corporate war would take place, a war that would be far more deadly than the fourth, something no one could even imagine. With that, Myers backed down and the Unification War came to an end within 2070, as a pact known as the Arvin Accord was signed, allowing Night City to go fully independent and for the NUSA to not use its aggression to grab land anymore. For the Militech troopers within Pacifica at the time, which included Colonel Kurt Hansen, he would be absolutely furious that the NUSA USA would betray them by signing this cowardly treaty of the Arvin Accords. Militech higher-ups ordered Kurt and his loyal troopers to immediately withdraw from the captured Pacifica region and take with them all of their resources and assets. But Kurt was absolutely furious with this order and immediately turned his back on his higher-ups, ordering his own troops to drop their NUSA colors and set up their own private paradise within the Pacifica area they had captured, going on to build up security borders on the already built up wall around it to make sure they were protected from any invading forces looking to arrest them for high treason. Kurt Hansen's loyal troopers would go on to paint their armor and weapons, helping them stand out as their own unique faction away from the once Militech brand and name themselves as the Bargast, after the famous mythical dog that incites fear on anyone who witnesses it, using its image as their logo that would fly on their flags and would be painted on their strongholds and vehicles. And with that image everywhere within the area, this region would become known to all as Dogtown. Not only was it ex-Militech soldiers, but it was also filled with new mercenaries, street punks, and other NUSA veterans who wanted to be a part of this new lawless land. After the Unification War had fully ended, Night City was in ruin once again despite being saved by the Arasaka Corporation. Finances were in absolute ruin thanks to all of the investors pulling out of Pacifica, and suddenly Night City was filled with homeless individuals individuals and families, and more and more gangs looking to take land for themselves, maybe inspired by what Kurt Hansen and his Bargast had done. Seeing that Pacifica, which had been known to all during the Unification War as being the combat zone, was now abandoned with no corpos living in the area, and tons of abandoned buildings not being constructed anymore, the homeless and gangs moved into the area, knowing full well they could not be touched when moving there. The NCPD saw this area as a complete loss cause, and just let it be free from from their involvement, allowing everyone there to do whatever they wanted to do. Drugs, illegal trading, smuggling, whatever they wanted to do, they would be free from the law and within Hansen's area in particular, they would be walled off from the rest of Night City, knowing full well that no one was going to invade the area to take it from them. Even Trauma Team did not really venture into the area to save any lives. However, this was mainly due to the fact that many people living there did not want to pay for their services and took their life into their own hands mainly due to the fact that Dogtown was extremely anti-corporation. New areas started being set up within Dogtown for specific groups. Kurt Hansen and his Bargas set up their headquarters within the Black Sapphire, where they would heavily guard it, but also set up regular parties for extremely notable guests from all over the world. To Kurt, despite his image of being anti-establishment, he really didn't care about who he did business with. He would invite police commissioners from Night City, politicians from overseas, infamous 
night runners and many other individuals into his land. As long as he got the money and power whilst also being able to run Dogtown, it really did not matter to him. With the Bargast being located within the Black Sapphire, this meant that most of the Golden Pacific area of Dogtown was heavily populated by these troopers, who would patrol the area making sure everything was kept in check, not as law and order, but more as a way to make sure people knew who was in charge of everything. Up within the half-constructed Luxor Heights region of Dogtown, the Haitian gang known as the Voodoo Boys would move in, setting up in the abandoned buildings creating their Netrunner hotspots. However, this Voodoo Boys gang would have differences compared to those within the coastal area of Pacifica, who were seen as being overly obsessed with the Black Wall and Alt Cunningham. And to those within Dogtown, they did not have time for that type of Netrunning projects and obsessions. That said, Netwatch still have a major presence within this part of the city, mainly due to what had happened with Alt Cunningham and also Sinoshore. And because of that, keep a close eye on all business going on within the area and specifically watch all net runners trying to get into the old net or even new net to grab data for themselves. Meaning the Voodoo Boys always have to watch their backs. Within the technology park of course contained the scavs who were obviously obsessed with the abandoned technology housed within it, trying to grab as much as they can from the exhibitions and the poor souls who dared ventured into their new territory. For the rest of the people housed within Dogtown such as those who were homeless or seeked a new lawless life somewhere new away from the corporations who had pushed them away from their once lives, they would go on to seek out a new home within the new creation of the Longshore Stacks. A genius idea from the general public, utilizing in the containers from the construction sites to store all of their things, set up their own shops, and even turn them into houses to live in. In the words of the Longshore Stacks resident Ronald P.T. Malone, Everything you see here, every little piece of fucking scrap metal and shit, is pre-war, chew. Them containers? They used to hold bricks and beans for building the hood. Shit got clapped, Avi. But them big-ass boxes ain't gone nowhere. Now we detowners, we resourceful. Some clever chooms grabbed them and behold, prem living space in high rises, no less. Right. Ain't no shit go to waste here, you know? Thanks to this whole creation, it has meant the people of the Stacks are a loyal community who work together for the betterment of society. And in fact, despite Dogtown being a lawless, rundown, dangerous place to live, the people of the Stacks have set up a grassroots initiative, a mission to make Dogtown a place where people work together, with the community handing out leaflets everywhere that read, remember, in Dogtown, you're never alone. Find yourself in need, there's a high chance someone can help. This is a two-way street. In return, you can help too. Whether it's lending a hand for someone's move or comforting a person in distress, we all have something to offer. Reciprocity doesn't mean exchanging the same favors. How about babysitting in exchange for legal advice? No matter what, kindness and compassion always comes back around. If we all follow the principles of mutual aid, we can make Dogtown town a better place for all. Feel free to contact Sky and Cold in the stacks. Everybody knows them, just ask around. Tell us what you need, offer what you can, and our neighbors will support you. You don't have to be alone. We're all in this together. As for the EBM Petrochem football stadium, at some point during the formation of Dogtown in 2070, a NUS Army cargo aerozep would be shot down by Kurtz Barges and would crash into the stadium, rendering it unusable by the Night City Corsairs. However, the Corsairs never actually moved to Night City. They still continued to play within Sacramento and their Night City ownership was only on paper. The people of Dogtown didn't do anything about the crashed NUS Army aerozep and instead left it within the stadium, utilizing its atomic fission engine in order to feed the arena and surrounding buildings with tons of energy, lighting up all of its outside sponsorship boards and all of the neon lights around the area. This would also allow the people of Dogtown to set up their brand new marketplace filled with tons of products that were from the black market and unable to be sold within Night City and America itself. This contained powerful cyberware, weaponized vehicles, powerful weaponry, body enhancers, and even 
even rare data shards from all over the world. It would appear that the dog tanners have also grabbed some of the exhibitions from the Terra Cognita Technology Park, such as the vehicles powered by Chu 2, the Militech display of the Basilisk, weapons showcase, and the cyberware displays to show it off to the paying customers and, of course, to sell it for a pretty eddy. This market would be known simply as the black market and would become extremely profitable for all of the marketeers and Kurds who engaged with the illegal gun trade, helping Dogtown to prosper and for Kurt Hansen to be well respected among all of the people living there and remain as the area's ruler, as he had given them the opportunity to embrace the prospering lifestyle. This stadium would now become the beating heart of Dogtown and surprisingly not only catered to the people living there, but also to many of Night City's largest corporations and influential players, really going to show that what Kurt offered whilst illegal everywhere else was totally worth it. Despite all of these changes, the Heavy Hearts Club remained relatively the same, looking like a brand new venue as if nothing had ever touched it over the years. An extremely symbolic building right in the heart of the area that offers anyone a chance to get away from the terror of the outside world and into a new life of glamour and luxury. But like it was when it first set up, the Heavy Hearts Club is only for the VIPs of Dogtown and not your average clientele. This club now offers everything you could wish inside it. Drugs, drinks, BDs, you name it. If you have the name for yourself to get into the club, you can get it. Inside, business discussions remain strong from criminals living within Dogtown and corporate owners from outside of the city walls, but also up on the top floor in the VIP room lay one of the most notable fixes in all of Night City, running his business from within the pyramid itself, that man being Mr. Hands, who to most people has never shown his face, and if he does, you know that he has your full trust and faith in your abilities. That's or he will make sure you will never tell anyone of who he is and his business. But Mr. Hands has other agendas within Dogtown. Watching closely the political situation within Dogtown, Hands will put into place plans for if anyone were to take out their leader, Kurt Hansen, realizing that two candidates of Bennett and Jago would be next to take up the mantle. For Hans, Bennett would be the best option as he would be easy to move around and keep an eye on. But for Jago, he would bring about more ruin and problems for Dogtown, and with it, Mr. Hans as well. With Bennett, Hans believes Dogtown could become a better place, with many people living within the shacks also agreeing, actively wanted to take back control from Hansen, who they believe has become too power hungry. Little does Hans know, however, that without the right persuasion, Bennett would come into power, but not on his own, seeking Arasaka's favor, who would only want to seek information of the Barga smuggling routes, ultimately meaning that Bennett would become Arasaka's puppet, and Dogtown, like many other places of the world, would be yet again another area run by the corporations. If Kurt Hansen were to suddenly fall as leader, Hans would have to make sure that the next leader that comes into power would have to be done tactfully, because it could either make or break this independent unique area. As the year turns 2077, Dogtown is still thriving, heavily guarded by their main faction of the Bargast, run well by Kurt Hansen, who has earned tons of fame within the land and outside of it, having friends in high places such as the NCPD Police Commissioner. VIP parties would also be regular occurrences within the Black Sapphire, with even giant pop stars such as Lizzie Wizzy performing her incredible new live show for all those lucky enough to see it. However, despite everything looking safe and secure within Dogtown, trouble would suddenly hit the land as Kurt Hansen would shoot down the president of the NUSA's Space Force One, which was passing overnight city, leading to a struggle between the NUSA forces and the Bargast, desperate to capture President Myers and make a power move. This whole event would bring into play the legendary yet desperate Merc known as V, who would be tasked with seeking out President Myers and saving her from Kurt's vicious faction. As V experiences this encounter, they would witness all Dogtown has to offer and all the secrets that are housed there and underneath the foundations. The fate of the area would solely be in the hands of V and their actions. Would they side with hands to make Dogtown a better place with him pulling all of the strings behind the scenes? Or will V decide what is best for Dogtown on their own after experiencing everything it has to offer? Maybe one day Night City will finally get to use the EBM Petrochem Stadium for their own Night City football team. And maybe Law and Order will finally take over over the area. But for now, this has been the story behind the lawless combat zone out within the Pacifica region. This has been the story of Dogtown.
I want to say a huge thank you for watching this video and do let me know what you thought of it and the Phantom Liberty expansion in the comments below. I absolutely loved it. I thought it was one of the best things I've played all year and it really revitalized my passion for cyberpunk and I've got many videos to come so stay tuned. I also want to say a massive thank you to my patrons for continuing to support this channel especially after this long break I've had. These include my small fishes, my big fishes Greg, Anthony and Arta Krem, my YouTube channel Wise One, Sith Lord 906, Video Game and 75 and Havig, my sharks Alfred Correa, Jason X117 and Wow Such Gaming and my Megalodons Sinus and Hazy Thor. If you enjoyed this video, please do leave a like, comment and sub if you haven't already. And if you want to support this channel further, all other links will be in the description below. But for now, a big thank you for watching it again, and I shall see you all in the next one. Cheers.